Welcome everyone. Welcome to Office Hours with Michael Kitsis. For today's Office Hours, I want to talk about the big news that just came out yesterday from the National Conference of the Financial Planning Association, which is underway this week. The big news is that the FPA just announced its new slate of national board members, including its new incoming president-elect and future chair, which will be Skip Schweiss of TD Ameritrade, who leads their trust company and their retirement plan solutions business for advisors. Which is significant, not only because it's the first time in its 20-year history that the FPA ever elected someone who does not hold the CFP marks to be the leader of the organization that holds itself out as the principal membership association for CFP professionals, but it's also the first time the FPA has ever elected someone who's not a practitioner from an advisory firm who teaches financial planning, but a vendor that sells to financial advisors and who writes very large sponsorship checks to the Financial Planning Association itself. In fact, even as the FPA announced at its annual conference that Schweiss from TD Ameritrade will be the FPA's new incoming president-elect and future chair, it also highlighted TD Ameritrade as one of just two cornerstone partners of the annual conference, which is FPA's top sponsorship tier for the entire organization. For those who aren't familiar, Cornerstone, Cornerstone Partnership with the FPA is a $200,000 sponsorship package, according to the FPA's own sponsorship kit. That's the biggest sponsorship check that any organization can write to the FPA. And TD Ameritrade actually has a more than 10-year history of being FPA's lead top-tier national sponsor almost every year since the mid-2000s, which means cumulatively, I believe TD Ameritrade is at least one of, if not the single largest cumulative sponsor that the FPA has had for the past decade, spending upwards of one to $2 million on FPA sponsorships. And now suddenly, coincidentally, for the first time in FPA's history, TD Ameritrade gets the first ever non-CFP vendor representative to be selected to be the future chair of the organization. Now, I think it's important to point out that I'm, I'm not necessarily opposed to having representatives from industry vendors be involved in the Financial Planning Association, including all the way up at the board level. The reality is as financial advisors, we do need vendors that provide us the, the products, the platforms, the services that we use to run our businesses and serve our own clients. And vendors that support financial planning are stakeholders of the Financial Planning Association. That's why the FPA's bylaws do state that a minimum of 75%, but a minimum of only 75% of its board members be CFP professionals. However, there's a difference between having a vendor representative be a member of the board and a non-CFP vendor representative becoming the future president of the entire organization, especially when that vendor also happens to be FPA's biggest financial sponsor. And especially when that vendor lobbies for advocacy positions that directly conflict with the FPA's fiduciary advocacy efforts, as TD Ameritrade has done. Uh, a case in point example is just earlier this year when Nevada issued draft regulations for its new state fiduciary rule and invited public comments. For those who aren't familiar, the basic gist of the Nevada rule is that it would apply a uniform fiduciary standard to both RIAs and representatives of broker-dealers who provide investment advice to clients. This is the exact uniform fiduciary standard that the FPA and the Financial Planning Coalition have advocated for for more than a decade now. In fact, the FPA has spent several years gearing up statewide chapters in large states like Florida and California specifically to get involved in state advocacy efforts to advance a uniform fiduciary duty at the state level. And the FPA's own website, Advocacy Priorities, explicitly state, FPA supports the adoption of appropriate uniform regulation for financial planners that includes a mandatory fiduciary standard of care for all professionals providing personal financial planning advice. Accordingly, when the Nevada rule came out, the FPA, along with the rest of the Financial Planning Coalition, submitted a public comment letter supporting Nevada's fiduciary rule as being consistent with the coalition's longstanding advocacy for a uniform fiduciary standard for investment advisors and broker-dealers. By contrast, when the Nevada fiduciary regulations were announced, TD Ameritrade not only opposed them in their public comment letter, but specifically stated that they thought it was important to maintain two distinct business models to serve investors, i.e. not a uniform fiduciary standard for all advisors. And TD Ameritrade even went so far as to threaten to discontinue offering services to the entire state of Nevada if the state went through with imposing a uniform fiduciary duty on its brokers. Furthermore, TD Ameritrade explicitly emphasized its support for the Wall Street lobbying organization SIFMA, which itself suggested that Nevada should put aside its fiduciary rule 
and defer to the SEC's regulation best interest, which also did not impose a fiduciary rule uniformly on RAs and broker-dealers that FPA has been advocating for, and instead, as we now know, is basically allowing broker-dealers to largely continue its conflict-laden business model as usual. In other words, the FPA has been a strong supporter of a uniform fiduciary duty for investment advisors and broker-dealers going all the way back to 2004 when it spun off its entire broker-dealer revision to become what's now the Financial Service Institute just so the FPA could take a focused lobbying effort on uniform fiduciary standards for advisors and sue the SEC back at the time. TD Ameritrade is a retail broker-dealer that runs alongside its RA custody business, has actively opposed a uniform fiduciary duty for investment advisors and broker-dealers, and instead has continued to lobby for separate standards for each to maintain the lower standard that currently applies to broker-dealers. And now TD Ameritrade, having spent a decade being FPA's largest sponsor writing the biggest checks, now as one of its company representatives as the future president of the FPA in a position to directly influence FPA's advocacy efforts that oppose TD Ameritrade's business interests. Now, to be fair, TD Ameritrade's institutional business for advisors, its RA custody unit, has generally been supportive of the advisor community, and Skip Schweitz himself is known as a fiduciary advocate, and his work in TD Ameritrade's retirement plan solutions business is largely aligned to a fiduciary duty already, albeit under ERISA. But TD Ameritrade is a large company, and it's Fair to recognize that it may support advisors in its institutional division, even as it competes against advisors with the advice provided by TD Ameritrade's retail brokers. But at the end of the day, the FPA from the 2000s sued the SEC when it issued a rule that undermined uniform fiduciary advice, while the FPA of today mysteriously punted on regulation best interests and failed to challenge the SEC this year in the biggest fiduciary advocacy opportunity of the decade, just as TD Ameritrade's representative was being evaluated by the nominating committee for board leadership. And while the FPA has been active at the state level, well, what happens if next year there's another state fiduciary proposal that would inform, that would impose a uniform fiduciary duty on investment advisors and broker-dealers, and the FPA wants to support it, and TD Ameritrade's retail division wants to oppose it again, and the CEO of TD Ameritrade calls Skip Schweiss and says, hey, I know you're responsible for advisor advocacy around here, but our retail brokerage business is going to take a $100 million hit by that state fiduciary rule that FPA is supporting. FPA's advocacy is costing us a lot of money. You need to get them back off as president of the FPA. Is Skip Schweiss really ready to get fired from TD Ameritrade if their next CEO decides to prioritize its retail division over the institutional division and advocates against the fiduciary rule that the FPA is trying to support and push through? And pushes FPA to try to get, uh, or pushes Skip to try to get FPA to change its tune? How exactly is Skip Schweiss, or anyone in that position, supposed to maintain their objectivity in a position of leadership with that kind of conflict of of interest looming over their head and their job on the line? And if Skip and TD Ameritrade push the issue, can the FPA even afford to say no to the president of its national board, who also happens to be its biggest national sponsor at the same time? Now, beyond the deeply concerning conflict of interest that the FPA's national board now faces with a future president from a vendor organization that actively opposes FPA's own advocacy agenda, the second concern about the FPA's newly announced leadership is that it means for the first time ever, the majority of its entire executive committee will be comprised of non-practitioners who also have no leadership experience with the FPA's lifeblood, its local chapter system. As the FPA's rising president, who will precede Skip Schweiss, is Martin C., a professor in the program chair for Kansas State University's financial planning program, who has a strong reputation for being a sharp and level-headed guy, but is someone who, like Skip, and unlike almost every other FPA president that has ever preceded them, has no history of being a chapter president before becoming a national president of the board. Now, again, I, I, to be fair, I don't think that every leader of the FPA has to be a chapter leader before becoming a national leader, although that has been by far the most common track for national leadership. But these are uniquely difficult times for the FPA in the first place. It was less than a year ago, still, that the FPA first announced its ill-fated One FPA initiative that would have unilaterally taken over and dissolved all 86 of its chapters and forcibly nationalized them. And the initiative was so out of tune with the actual needs and desires of the membership and the chapter leaders 
that the FPA's national leadership faced a huge backlash, and despite having already announced the One FPA Network as a done deal at the chapter leadership conference last November, just a few months later had to completely retract the entire initiative and instead walk it all the way back to a beta test where they'll try just a few of the things proposed in the One FPA Network and then maybe sort of might end up bringing it back in a couple of years around 2022 or so. And so even as the FPA is reeling from national leadership putting years of energy into a 1FPA network proposal, only to have it struck down by chapter leaders who said national was out of touch with their needs, FPA national now responds with a second year in a row of electing a president who has no chapter experience. How is this possibly going to help the FPA national leadership get better in touch with what chapters want and need when the executive committee has less and less representation from anyone who has ever actually spent any time in chapter leadership with experience and can connect with the membership? Especially since not only did the FPA expand its executive committee to include its first non-CFP vendor and become two-thirds leaders of an 86-chapter organization despite having no chapter leadership themselves, but it's also notable that the newest slate of national board members includes several more non-CFPs that further dilutes and moves FPA away from its stated purpose of being the principal membership association for CFP professionals. As a result, the FPA national board retired out four CFP professionals this year and replaced them with only two CFPs and two non-CFPs. And one of the two CFPs is an international representative whose CFP certification is actually from the Netherlands and technically isn't valid here in the U.S., which is notable not only because it means the FPA added only one U.S. CFP practitioner to its slate of four new board members this year, but also because if its international member CFP marks aren't valid here in the U.S., the FPA's national board is no longer at least 75% CFP professionals, which means the FPA may now actually be in violation of its own bylaws for failing to maintain the required representation of CFP certificates. And this is even as the FPA's representation of CFP professionals across the country falls to an all-time low. When FPA was formed 20 years ago, its membership included more than 50% of all CFP professionals. By 10 years ago, it was down to only 30% CFP professionals who were FPA members. Now, the FPA is about to fall below 20% of CFP professionals who are FPA members. And in response to this reality that the FPA is so out of touch with its chapters that they repudiated its one FPA network initiative and is so out of touch with the needs of CFP professionals, its market share has dropped by more than half, its solution is to reduce chapter leadership representation on its executive committee and reduce representation of CFP professionals on its board? Maybe the FPA has a master plan about how broader diversity of views from non-chapter leaders and non-CFP professionals will suddenly give it better insight about how to connect with chapter leaders and the more than 60,000 CFP professionals who aren't members. But call me skeptical. Now, perhaps the greatest irony of all of these concerns about the FPA's latest slate of national board members and leadership is that the organization is in the midst of changing its nominating committee structure, an aspect of the original 1FPA network that is still on the table to be implemented this year. Under the 1FPA network proposal, the national board's nominating committee would shift from its current structure, where the national board populates the whole nominating committee with its own national board members, uh, which has already been criticized by, uh, by some as being a very insular and self-perpetuating group, to a structure where half the nominating committee will be comprised of FPA chapter leaders from the FPA's new 1FPA council, and only the other half will be designated directly by the national board. And, and I can't help but wonder if this slate of board members, of non-CFP board members and non-chapter experienced leadership, would have been the leaders that would have been chosen by chapter leaders themselves if they had had more of a hand in this nominating process for national board leadership this year. Unfortunately, though, the chapter leaders never actually got a chance to contribute this year under the new structure, as even though the 1FPA council is being formed and is actually supposed to convene it for the first time next month at the chapter leaders conference, in August two months ago, the FPA modified its own bylaws to require its nominating committee must have been appointed at least 180 days prior to the elections which by the stroke of a pen made it impossible to actually include the new 1FPA Council's feedback in this year's board nominees because six months ago would have been back in February and back then the FPA was still deciding whether it was going to move forward with the 1FPA Network Initiative or not due to the huge backlash it was taking at the time. And at the same time just now in August, the FPA also modified its bylaws to permit the current president to become a non-voting member of the nominating committee when Previously, the president was excluded to limit the undue influence that 
current leadership can have on future leadership choices. And that's on top of the bylaws stipulating that the FPA chair will be the chair of the nominating committee and its tiebreaker vote, and maintaining a rule that the president-elect gets to be a voting member of the committee as well. Furthermore, with the new bylaws, the national board still explicitly reserves the right to approve or disapprove and effectively veto whoever the chapter select as their chapter leader representative on the nominating committee and the national board reserves the right to approve or veto any candidate the chapter leaders propose off of the nominating committee and the national board reserves the right to just go off script and choose its own candidate that wasn't proposed by the nominating committee and the chapter leaders in the first place which means even as the FPA has emphasized that it's changing its nominating committee to better incorporate chapter leader feedback in a participatory governance model, in actuality, it's been engineered to have veto rights over any nominating committee members that the chapter select that national board doesn't want, veto rights to any candidate that the chapter leaders do select that the national board doesn't want, the ability to choose entirely new candidates outside of what the nominating committee selects, all while stacking the entire existing executive committee in the room with the nominating committee, including the board chair as the chair of the nominating committee with the tiebreaker vote. So frankly, it's not really clear to me whether anything is actually going to change or be different with FPA's leadership selection process. And of course, with the FPA's latest set of changes to its bylaws, there was nothing about, say, a conflict of interest policy and selecting a representative from your largest sponsor who also happens to be actively opposing your organization's advocacy positions from then being selected as the incoming president-elect and future chair of the organization. Now, to be fair, the FPA does have an existing conflict of interest policy, which states that FPA leaders shall avoid placing or avoid the appearance of placing one's own self-interest or any third-party interest above that of the FPA, and that board leaders should not be engaged in any outside business that would directly or indirectly materially adversely affect the FPA. But I guess that's a requirement that FPA leaders avoid even the appearance of placing a third-party interest above that of the FPA doesn't apply the FPA's own national board, its nominating committee, and its largest sponsor. Maybe that's something we can consider changing in the future when we finally get through the one FPA network beta test and can refocus on what the FPA actually needs to do to get growing again under new leadership. Now, I, I want to note through all this that I'm not raising this concern here because I have anything against the FPA. I'm a 17-year dues-paying member of the FPA. I'm a former chapter president. I've been on too many national committees to count over the years and have been a chair for one of its national conferences. And as I've advocated for years, I believe that a strong FPA is absolutely essential to the financial planning profession itself. Every profession needs a professional membership association, and the FPA is and has always been best positioned to take the mantle of leadership as the principal membership association for CFP professionals. Heck, if the FPA could have just maintained its market share of CFP professionals it had when it was formed 20 years ago, the FPA would literally be more than double its current size. It would be nearly 50,000 members instead of barely 23,000, with drastically more resources to support all of us as planners, better capabilities to engage in the exact kind of regulatory advocacy for financial planners that the FPA claims to prioritize. But the FPA is going to get back on track and growing again, and get its chapters growing with CFP professionals, a good starting point would be to keep the board actually focused on CFP professionals, the purpose stated in its bylaws, not reduce their representation and not select leadership that isn't in touch with the needs of chapters and financial advisor members and not appoint an executive committee that for the first time ever is two-thirds non-practitioner, non-chapter leader to be led by a representative from a multi-billion dollar corporate sponsor that espouses opposing advocacy views. So perhaps in the coming year, the new nominating committee structure with the one FPA council, even still largely controlled by the national board and the current executive committee, will be enough to finally help nudge the FPA in a new and better direction with new leadership that can get the FPA growing again the way it should be growing. Or at least for the sake of the financial planning profession, the FPA itself, I really hope so. This is Office Hours with Michael Kitsis. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and have a great day.